Your Technology Tutor Program, Episode 5. Today's topic, Understanding Your Home Computer Network. Welcome to the Your Technology Tutor Program, where you'll learn how to be more successful using personal technologies like Mac computers, iPhones and iPads, useful software, cool web tools, videotaping and editing, digital photography, and more. And, more. and now, here's the host of our program, your technology tutor, Chet Davis. Hello and welcome to today's program. Pleased to have you along with me as together we learn to become more successful in the use of our personal technologies. Today's topic is designed uh, to share with you kind of some of the basics, some of the foundations for home computer networks. This is not designed to train somebody to become a home computer installation expert or to give you, uh, you know, if you've been studying home computer networks for a long period of time, this is not the class for you. This is not the session. This program is designed for what I call the commoner, the, the common person, the every person like me out there who has a desire and a need to understand their personal computer network. And, I mean, so many of us have a personal computer network, and it's important we have at least a, a basic understanding of what the different parts are and how it works, and perhaps most importantly, how to keep it secure. You might be really surprised how many people have insecure or unsecure. What's the right word there? I think insecure. No, maybe an insecure is means it's shy and it needs a friend. But unsecure home networks, and you're opening up you and your family to, you know, cyber thieves, to them getting in, getting data, you know, just stuff we don't want. All right. So here's how, what we're going to cover today. We're going to start with the concept of wired and wireless data distribution. Then we're going to jump into what I call the pieces of the puzzle. A, just a brief summary, uh, an overview of the different gear, the equipment that's involved. So if you wanted to or needed to replace the parts for your home computer network, you have an idea of what, you know, what, what you're talking about. And lastly, concerns and considerations. Largely, what we're focused on there is how to secure your home computer network. This is also, by the way, not a topic um, that is really applicable or appropriate to an, an institution, uh, to a large business. There's other concerns and considerations you should take into account when doing that. You want to talk to a qualified professional. Again, this topic is for home technology network. Now I'm going to do my best to limit the techno jargon as much as possible during this as well as my other programs here on Your Technology Tutor. But but some of these TLAs, what I call three letter acronyms, get it TLAs? <laughs> Should have a little laughter sound effect, maybe not. Uh, they're unavoidable because the technology is known by these names. And when you go to your local, you know, consumer electronics store and you want to purchase a device, you kind of got to know those TLAs. So, um you will find references to the main concepts presented today, including any links discussed. I've got some other helpful links to point out to you at the end of the program, along with a glossary of the acronyms that I use. These will be found in the show notes, and you'll find that information on my website at yourtechnologytutor.com. That's yourtechnologytutor.com forward slash five, just the numeral five. That'll get you to this program because it's the fifth episode of the Your Technology Tutor program. First of all, let's jump into the concept of wired and wireless data distribution. Yikes, that's a mouthful. So a home network is just like a computer network at a business or school, but it's in your home. So it's, we're talking about a smaller, you know, a smaller area by, by square feet but also smaller in terms of the amount of computers that are going to be using it, for most of us at least, um, and just you know the, the kind of impact that you need and also the kind of concerns you need. So we're not um, dealing with you know grades uh, you know that, that a, a, a school network is going to be you know, needing at a college or university. And we're not talking about um, you know all the banking information if you're, you're, you're talking about the data security at the Wells Fargo Bank or Bank of America or First Union Bank, whatever. okay So we're talking about home, although we do want to keep it secure from our own personal uh, and private data. But let's define a network, okay? We're talking about two or more computers or other devices that are connected to a service that provides them with data. And we're going to see that also takes data from those computers and sends it up to the Internet. 
This setup where devices are connected locally is also known as a LAN, a LAN, capital L, capital A, capital N, which is the acronym or abbreviation for local area network. So in your home, you may have a local area network. Today, the key, the key consideration is to access data, information, video, audio, documents that might be out there in the internet on file servers, or you might be connecting to another computer. We're actually using an intermediary computer to connect between those two. Now, you know, so that's really why most of us have networked computers in our home, is the um, access of information and sharing of information. And again, that information can take the form of, of data in terms of documents. I mean, kid turning in a homework assignment to his or her teacher can be sharing photos, uh, you know, stories, digital letters, uh, video, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's stuff we can generate and send or it's stuff that we can download or find on the Internet or from other individuals, family, friends, etc. Now, the additional benefit of a home network today, and a lot of people are putting this into practice, is we can set it up so there are shared devices like printers, storage devices like hard drives to save or back up and archive our most important data, and also the ability sometimes to stream content like music, photos, um, uh, videos uh, from one computer in your house to either a different computer or to a smart TV or a display device without actually having to put that TV in a different room, you know, put the computer in a different room from the TV. So pretty cool stuff. Now, when we're doing that, when we're accessing other devices like that, like uh, if I'm sitting on the couch and I'm using my laptop and I want to print out a document without actually being physically connected using the wireless connection, okay, that's called a work group in the workspace. When we're in our home network, we call that a home group. So a home group is more than just, uh, you know, accessing information via the Internet. That's what many of us did for many years. But it's grown to have the ability, and we're going to talk about that later in the program, the ability to connect to printers inside of your, your home network. All right, so um, here's kind of a summary of what's going on. And, and I'll have a diagram in the show notes to make this more clear if you're a visual learner. The Internet signal is delivered to our home via a provider. Okay, We call that service an ISP, which is the acronym for Internet Service Provider. So if you hear a bunch of techno geeks talking at a party, you know, the next barbecue you go to, hey, who'd you, who'd, who's your ISP? I'm really happy with what they're talking about is they're talking about the company that provides their internet whether it's AT&T or Comcast or or some other provider okay they're the folks that they pay a monthly fee to usually and those people deliver internet to your home okay now we're going to call the point or place in your home where the signal comes in and then is transmitted out to the other devices. Let's call that the gateway. So it's like the gateway to the internet in your home. Okay. So that gateway is your is 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 a couple of different devices together, and they're tied together with a cable that your ISP, Internet Service Provider, provides you the internet signal, and then it goes out to the devices in your home. Okay. So there's 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 two ways we can distribute that signal now that it's in our home. There's wired distribution or wireless distribution okay wired distribution sort of obviously requires the use of cables to connect each computer and device to the network so from your gateway device which we're going to talk about there's two devices usually minimum that are part of your gateway and we're going to talk about equipment in a moment here but the imagine that gateway think of it as a box okay that's the the gray box and uh, each computer or device has to have a cable connected to your gateway that connects then into your computer. And most people use a connector called an Ethernet connector. Okay, And many contemporary computers have that Ethernet port or that Ethernet jack, the place where the Ethernet cable plugs in. It's a, it's like a very it's larger. Those of you who remember the telephones when you used to actually plug them in the wall, um, that little connector it looks exactly like that with a little prong on it that always used to snap off on me. Okay, well that it's it's like two two and a half times larger than that. That's an Ethernet cable, and the Ethernet cable runs between 
uh, also known as a CAT45 cable, runs between your gateway and your device. Okay, Nice thick cable. Um, the benefits of wired networking is that you don't suffer any loss of signal as long as you're connected. You know, you plug it in, and for the most part, as long as the settings are all correct, it works. It's not like you have to think, okay, I need to move over here to get my wireless signal to work. In fact, I'm going to throw a, a, a link to a great cartoon. I found a great cartoon. I shared it on my Facebook page last week about the the real impact of wireless. And it shows like somebody's house and where they want to be with their computer is the only area of the house where there is no wireless connection. Okay? So for desktop computers, for home entertainment systems, for those components, those devices that don't move around, a wired connection may be an ideal solution. Okay, because it you know you don't have to be moving it around. So a permanent cable is a fine thing. It works. It fits as long as it's not too far away from your device or on another floor of the house, for example. That can be tricky. So in, in our home, we're in a two-story home, and my uh, my lab, my office is is upstairs. And that's where the gateway is because of all the computer activity I've got in my lab here, okay? And I do, I have a, a hardwired cable that runs downstairs, and that connects to one of our devices. And then we also have wireless. So you're going to see there's a blending. You can do a blending, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, between wireless and wire, okay? Now, the downside with a wired configuration is that, you know, you're stringing this special cable, so it's not as convenient. So it's not something most people want to use for your um, laptop, you know, because uh, theoretically you, you want to be able to move your laptop around and use it remotely when you want to use it. Okay, And on most portable devices today, there is no Ethernet port. They require a wireless connection. So you couldn't use your iPad or your iPhone or your Droid, whatever, on a wired connection. It, ha it has to have the wireless. So you have to have that for the more contemporary mobile devices. Now, so that's wired, a wired connection. Wireless, on the other hand, sends or more accurately transmits the Internet signal to and from devices which are remotely connected okay now this is ideal as i pointed out for mobile devices the downside for using wireless or wi-fi w capital w i capital f i is is the commercial name for really what is known as a wireless local area network the uh the ben the downside rather of using the wi-fi connection is there's two of them really first the wireless signal does not cover every area in a building equally okay uh, walls or other obstructions can limit the wi-fi signal uh, sometimes it can be weak or e or even non-existent in some rooms and even some areas of the same room so in one corner of the room you might get great wi-fi you get you know four or five bars of a signal but in the other end one or two or nothing and that's not uncommon okay so um, that that's one issue, you know, the weakness of the signal, the strength of the signal if you're on a wireless network. If you're distributing a Wi-Fi signal into a large home or even outside areas of your home, the signal may not be strong enough to cover all those areas and in, inside as well. The other downside, you know, item number two to be aware of when sharing your home network wirelessly amongst your devices is the issue of security. It's very important to ensure that others outside your intended network are not accessing our data or devices or piggybacking off your internet signal. Again, we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail and some um, you know, strong, clear suggestions for ensuring your security uh, at the end of our program. All right, let's jump in here and talk for a second about what I call the pieces of the puzzle, the gear, the equipment, okay? And and there's just a couple. At your gateway, there are two. There's the broadband modem, and there's also the router. Now, the modem, um, it, it, which, by the way, is actually an acronym. Most people don't know that. It's, it's an acronym. It's short for modulate, M-O-D, and demodulate, okay? MO for modulate, DEM for demodulate, which means to encode or decode. That's the device that takes the incoming internet signal from our ISP. Remember what that is? Internet service provider, good. And it decodes the signals into a pattern that can be shared and used by our digital devices, okay? And um, 
We're going to talk about IP address in a minute, so I, I won't get into that right now. But really, the signal's coming down in a different form that the computer uh, can't use by itself. It has to be decoded for the computer to use. So if you just took the internet signal that's coming from your ISP, your internet service provider, and plug it in your computer, it ain't going to work. Okay? That's my slang. It ain't going to work. Okay, you you got to decode it first. There's two main types of modems found in most home networks. There's a DSL modem or a cable modem. Now, the DSL uses a technology known as digital subscriber line, whereas a cable modem takes a signal from the same looking cable. If if you you know had a cable for cable TV outside your house and you still do, okay, that's the cable. That's that cable not only carries um, uh, TV signals today, but can also carry digitally uh, incorporated data. So it can actually have computer data going on that same system, and then it decodes it in that box, and it can split it off so it's sending the 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 cable TV signals over here, and your data over here. Okay, now that's not something that most of us get a choice in, uh, oftentimes because of the uh, provider, whether it's your cable company or your local telephone company providing your internet service, which is typically the case, at least in most um, uh, cities in the USA, the, there is a huge amount of expense that they put into delivering those signals to people's homes because they've got to run those cables out to every street and every community and then have the opportunity to run a cable from that distribution point in your neighborhood out to every home. So that's a huge amount of equipment and personnel hours to wire a community. Yeah, they're going to make it back in a, you know, in in not too distant period of time if you look at the cable bills from some of my friends. So, but oftentimes you have one choice. Sometimes you do have more than one choice. Like in my community, I can choose in addition to the satellite providers, there is the ability to do both DSL or I could go with a different provider who has a cable modem. Okay, so you do have those choices. By the way, I should clarify that this this transmission of data is not a one-way street. It's not just us taking stuff from the internet. I sort of hinted at that at the beginning of the program. Okay, for the early early years of internet popularity, it was this just a one-way street. Mostly, you know, you've got mail and you get your mail, and you well, you could send some mail back, but not very big big needs. But the primary concern was to have a good speed or service on your download of data, the signal coming into our home and our computers. But in recent years, okay, it's the signal. It's become increasingly important for many consumers to also have good, fast, high quality upload speed. This facilitates our ability to upload, to send documents photos even high resolution photos video high resolution video via the the internet so uh download and upload speeds which by the way are are two different entirely speeds and we're going to do another program uh upcoming in the next couple of weeks about that topic um you know understanding uh your internet service okay let's go ahead and take a break and catch this week's cool find Every program, uh, I'm going to have uh, what I call my cool find. And the cool find is a cool gadget or tool or online service that I think is particularly worthy of sharing with you. This week, it's a website. Well, it's on a website. More specifically, it's a web browser. Okay. It's called Google Translate. You may have used it, you may have heard of it, but it, not, not all of my friends have. And so I wanted to share this. The very useful function allows us to use this service that the folks at Google have provided that gives us an almost instant translation from one of, uh, I think, about 20 different languages, more than that now, into your own language, assuming you're one of the target languages. And it can translate a word, a phrase, a paragraph, a whole page of text. But the thing that I use most often is the ability to translate entire websites. Yes, it can translate an entire website. So one of the communities I work with uses a product that is manufactured in Germany, and the news on their website is in the German language. So for me to stay on top of it, to stay you know current and relevant, I have to kind of check in, and I, I know just enough of a German language to be dangerous. And what I, I had a couple years of German language in high school. Um, 
But what I do is I open up the Google Translate application and select from language as German. There's even a thing it'll say detect languages, okay? But I, I like to make it all the more clear and, and, and have it do its best job. So I select the language. Yeah, it's from the German language and I want it to go into English. So you, you select from, there's a from side, select German. And on the to side, I select English. And then I click the blue translate button after I drop in the URL for the web page I want to change. So what you do is you go to, maybe you're searching on the internet for some important research data. Or maybe you're planning a vacation to a country who speaks another language, okay? And maybe it's a website for a hotel that only has that website in their native language. And you heard this is a phenomenal hotel. Or you just see it and you go, oh, I got to stay there. That's beautiful. Okay? And I can tell you a couple of those. Oh, we stayed at a couple last year. They're just phenomenal. So you drop that URL in there and translate it, and you'll it'll, instantly it shows the website. Now, the cool thing is, well, when you're clicking to different parts, different pages on that same website, it'll translate them almost immediately, too. The only thing it doesn't work is if the website is an older technology called Frames. It doesn't translate inside of those frames. It's a different structure. But you'll find Google Translate by clicking on the More tab when you visit Google.com and then scroll down to select Translate. If you just need to translate a word or paragraph, again, you just copy the copy and paste the text into that the, the 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 text box okay but if you want to translate an entire web page then you want to go ahead and enter the url the web page address for that particular website okay so that's this week's cool find <laughs> Okay, back to our topic at hand. We we already covered the first part of the gateway, and that's what we call the modem. Next is the router, okay? Now, when the internet signal enters your home, it's often usually what we call a single IP address or internet protocol address. Think of it like, it's kind of like a phone number, okay? And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But it's the job of the router, which is connected to your modem, to receive the signal and then interpret it to split it up and route it. So the modem decodes it, and the router's job, it's kind of like a traffic cop at a busy intersection, okay? The router says, okay, signal, go there. No, go over there, go over there now, go over there now, go over there, take this signal in. Oh, next, you're coming in, okay, next, come on over here, come on over here. So the router's splitting that all up. It, it's happening so fast that there's no way you're gonna detect a slowdown. Very few people would ever, frankly, okay? So it's not worried about that. Back quickly to the IP address. Some internet service providers give you a designated IP address, like a dedicated phone number, and you may know your IP address depending on your provider. Others provide what they call a dynamic IP address that changes every time somebody logs off and back on the internet. Okay. Now, there was a time when there were wired and wireless routers, and you had to choose between them if you were going to buy a new one, for example. Okay. But nowadays, pretty much many if not all of the routers are are available with the capacity to do both having the wired ports in case you want to do the wired connection in your home as well as the wireless broadcasting so it's not only a, a router that's doing the routing of the signal it's actually broadcasting that signal in a defined space to the devices that you choose to connect with it OK, so you have the ability to do both. And that's when I when I uh, Im improved our home networking a little more than a year ago. I bought a new newer router and uh, with some of the newer technology I'm going to talk about now. And that made a dramatic improvement on our wireless reception in our home. OK, again, Wi-Fi, which is the commercial name for the wide local area network, has an effective range of around 65 feet. Okay, if you're on the metric system, we're talking about 20 meters indoors. And the uh, industry says it will transmit farther when it's out of doors because there's, you know, there's less interruptions. You don't have the walls and furniture and et cetera to deal with. Now, there are different standards and technologies used by today's wireless routers. These are usually plainly marked when purchasing new equipment. I just want to talk about two of them just because if you're checking it out and if you're, you know, if you've had your 
router in your home for some period of time and you're thinking hey i got this brand new smart tv uh or you know we've got this a new computer and i want to put it down in the the study and we've never had one down there because it gets weak wireless signals i would recommend you consider replacing your older modem with a newer modem you might be very surprised at the increased performance you get Okay, so there's two standards I want to talk about. First, there's a standard as published by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. We call the, that group of that that entity the IEEE, I E E E. Okay, now their standard for Wi-Fi networking is called 802.11, 802.11. Okay, there's variations though. There's 802.11a, 802.11b, and 802.11g. Now, they have different speeds they operate at, but they have the same or similar maximum data rate. Now, I did choose to go with an 802.11g and am very, very pleased with its performance. Okay. Now, the other technical term you're going to see that they talk about in terms of routers and, and, and electronics performance is the speed, and that is expressed in something we call gigahertz. And on a box, you know, on the equipment, if you're looking at an online catalog, it's expressed with a capital G, capital H, lowercase z, gigahertz, which stands for millions of hertz. Okay. So that's the number of it, it. We're measuring the frequency, the speed at which those electronic waves move. That's a little deeper than we want to get. Okay. But there's two different speeds. You have a five gigahertz speed router. And you have a 2.4 giga, gigahertz speed router. More is not always better. Some experts saying if you're going with one or the other, the 2.4 gigahertz technology might be better suited because the higher the frequency, the shorter the range. It covers a shorter distance. A lot of people think, you know, oh, more is better always. Arr, arr, arr. No, not necessarily. But here's the best of all, uh, the best option probably is to consider what we're seeing more and more, and that's a dual band device. It combines the best of both types of hardware. So it integrates both the 5 gigahertz frequency and the 2.4 gigahertz frequency. That's the modem. Actually, we've got a couple since then that I have chosen to put in my home. Again, the 802.11G and a dual band device. And it works really well. Okay? A growing uh, um, device that we're seeing more and more often is an NAS device. And that's an acronym for Network accessed storage this is a newer piece of equipment that allows you to store computer data on the network using the network okay now many of us are already familiar with the use of external hard drives that we connect to our computer by plugging a you know usb cable in or firewire cable in and then we back it up either say backup now we drag and drop stuff or if it's part of a an automatic backup plan like I use the uh, time machine on my Mac computers okay the NAS function is a feature that's included in some of today's routers so what you do is you actually connect a, a separate external hard drive a USB hard drive to the router and there's a port for it it says NAS device and you can remotely back up one or more computers in your home area in your home network using the router in fact there's even an auto program that you can set to back up it's really cool and, and that might be something you want to consider using. Now, there are other potential devices, a network switch, a network bridge. I'm not going to get into those in this program. Just know that if your home is supremely large, you're living in a grand estate, and you've got a lot of rooms to cover, then you want to consult a home networking specialist or expert who's going to walk you through the steps. You can't just keep adding more and more routers, like put a cable and put a router. It has to be configured differently in what they call a switch or a bridge that essentially lets you build nodes or pods on your network. Okay. Lastly, there's the end device, you know, computers, home entertainment devices. We mentioned the obvious ones like your desktop and laptop computer. More recently, the proliferation of mobile devices like smartphones and tablets, pads, iPads, iPad mini, etc. Now, the benefit of using your home Wi-Fi connection while at home is not only that you're likely to have a solid, stable signal, but also the fact that you'll not be pulling data from your monthly service plan. What I mean is this. If you're on your iPad or your iPhone and you're you know, watching videos, maybe you're watching Netflix or even, you know, videos on YouTube or downloading music, whatever. Okay. If you're on your 
your service provider, whoever that is, ATT, Verizon, okay, Sprint, I want to be careful, about Virgin Atlantic, whoever it is, okay, you're paying them for X amount of data every month, okay? But when you're connected to your home wireless network, you're no longer paying them. You're getting all that data and more maybe, and it's included in your home wireless setup, okay? We don't pay for the amount of data we download or upload, which the, the technical term is it's not metered. They're just delivering it to us, at least now, okay? So that's another benefit. If you're creating a home group, remember that's the one where you want to include peripherals like printers and even scanners that are compatible with your home network and allow you to access those devices from any compatible device on your home network. Okay, You want to set up a home group, and there's different instructions for that depending on your network. But that's a really, really nice feature. And then we have uh, you know, the newer devices like smart TVs, uh, home entertainment systems, or the little digital TV boxes like the Roku and Apple TV and others that connect to your home network and can deliver a multitude of Internet-delivered uh, entertainment choices. All right, so those are the devices. Now, the, the last part of the program, I want to focus for just a couple minutes, what I call the security concerns. So these are important only if you choose to use Wi-Fi as any part of your home network. If you're connected between your home gateway and your devices via cable, there's no or little risk of data security. But if you're distributing the internet via a wireless signal in our home, not only can neighbors, but also potential cyber criminals could access your network and the data on your individual devices by hacking, in some cases not working too hard, easily entering your network. It's surprising, but there's a lot of folks who have a home computer network, they have not even changed the password on their router. There's an industry default that many cyber thieves know about and can easily use to gain access to your network and possibly access banking data, financial security data, um, you know, social security information, information about your children, et cetera, that are on your computer. So you want to be careful. Here are suggestions from the National Cyber Security Alliance. Now, I do have um, uh, the link for this group's website, by the way, in the show notes if you want to go back and reference that. So here's some simple steps we all can do. First of all, when you're setting up your router, and the instructions are very clearly marked in the box of most routers, you want to change the name of your router. This is the default identification or ID. It's called a service set identifier. Okay, It's assigned by the manufacturer. Change it so that it's not easily discernible from somebody outside. Biggest one change the preset password on your router okay it'll work right out of the box but it's that preset password that everybody who buys that manufacturer's brand will also be using and oftentimes the name of the router is tied with the name of the company so it's easy for a cyber criminal to get in so change it and if you know, use a mix of numbers letters symbols make it difficult okay and i do have a program Okay, my earlier podcast talks all about passwords. I believe that's episode number two. You want to visit that. Okay, your technology tutor forward slash numeral two. Um, check that out. Uh, next, review the security options. When setting up your router, we usually have one, two, or three different choices for the, the level of security. In other words, what kind of security enabled uh, operation do we want to choose? There's WEP. WPA2 or WPA. Okay, Experts recommend going for WPA2 if it's available. That's the most secure. The next most secure is WPA, but WEP is the least common, the least secure. I shouldn't say least common, the least secure of the choices. So now it, it's better than nothing. Okay, If all you got is WEP, that's better than nothing. But if you have a choice between the three, go for WPA or best choice, WPA2. And what that is, that's a level of encryption. Okay? It's the kind of, of, of cloaking uh, it does on the signal so folks outside cannot easily intercept it. If your device allows, another suggestion is to create a guest password. We have that on our home area network. So like when my youngest son's buddy comes over and they want to use you know computers together or something, we can give him the guest password. Some routers, the more contemporary, the newest routers allow for that. So they're accessing the network on a separate password. They don't have the same privileges, which is good because they can't access all of the stuff. 
Okay, and you can change that more easily. That way, you can keep the one that the, you and you know your family, your immediate family uses. And if you needed to, you could change it for your guests occasionally. So somebody, if you suspect you have a falling out, I don't know, you know, you, you it prevents them from all of you having to forget your own password. Okay, and that's only advisable if you have a lot of visitors over, if that you know who use technology. Lastly, we're recommended to use a firewall. And a firewall, it's very interesting imagery, isn't it? There are software firewalls. In fact, you probably already have one if you've bought a computer in the last couple of years. It's already included as part of Windows, and it's already included as pack of the, a part of the Mac OS X. Okay? The firewalls keep the hackers out from using the computer to send personal information without your permission. Okay, You've probably heard of the term like a Trojan horse, where if you download somebody's suspicious email or click on a website that maybe you shouldn't have clicked on, it downloads an executable program. It's possible for them to have a device inside your computer that's sending your data out to them or using your computer to post stuff on the Internet without you even knowing about it. Okay, so antivirus software is good for scanning incoming emails and fire, you know, files. It's totally different. You need both. You need antivirus software, but the firewall is like a guard, and it alerts you if somebody's attempting to access the system, and it will block communications with sources that you don't want to have happen. Okay, it protects the operating system, etc. You know, in the show notes, I do have two links for you. There's a link for setting up the, the highest level of firewall protection inside of Windows device and also how to set up and recognize the firewall settings inside of Mac OS X. Okay? So those are a couple of different options for you there. All right, well, uh, on my website, yourtechnologytutor.com, you'll find growing episodes of this program as well as regular posts, uh, practical technology news, tips, I have uh, video lessons, video tutorials there, and more on my website. You'll find that at yourtechnologytutor.com. That's yourtechnologytutor.com. That's it for today's program. Thanks so much for joining me. It's great to have you along. Again, the links presented in today's program, along with a summary and additional notes and resources, will find at the show notes, which are at www yourtechnologytutor.com forward slash numeral five yourtechnologytutor.com forward slash number five the next topic our next program email faux pas the most common mistakes people make using email and their unintended consequences and how to fix them have a great day